Chapter Eleven of the Awakening of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Awakening of Europe by M. B. Singh. Chapter Eleven: The Massacre of Saint Bartholomew. Twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. Shakespeare. But the Netherlands was not the only place where persecution for religion was going on. Though Spain and the Netherlands lay paralyzed under the heavy hand of the Inquisition, yet France and England were taking part, together with the rest of Europe, in the struggle between Protestants and Roman Catholics. And this very year, when the Protestants seemed to be gaining ground in the Netherlands, France was to be stained with a crime which can never be forgotten and which historians must always remember, as one of the greatest blots in the annals of mankind. This was the wholesale massacre of the Protestants, or Huguenots, as they were called in France, on a terrible summer night in the year 1572. Francis, King of France, had left a delicate little brother to succeed him on the throne, and his mother, Catherine de' Medici, was to govern the kingdom till the boy Charles was old enough and strong enough to rule it himself. She was a rigid Roman Catholic, and hated the Huguenots with her whole heart. Indeed, like her neighbor Philip over the Pyrenees, she made up her mind to crush them out of the country. The leaders of the French Huguenots were the young Henry of Navarre and the Prince of Condé, and it was against these two that Catherine de' Medici plotted. She planned a marriage between her daughter Margaret and young Henry of Navarre, the former being a Roman Catholic, the latter a Huguenot. It seemed strange to those who looked on, and men grew suspect to the motives of the Queen Regent. "'We shall marry the two religions,' said the King of France, who was entirely under his mother's control. Still, amid murmurs of discontent, the wedding preparations went forward, until the day arrived for Henry, now King of Navarre, to come to Paris for his bride. Attended by the Prince of Condé, the old warrior Huguenot Admiral Coligny, and eight hundred distinguished followers, the King of Navarre rode into the French capital, his handsome face and winning smile attracting all alike. Still, there were murmurs of disapproval, and the air was heavy with evil rumors. The wedding day came. It was the 18th of August, a glorious summer morning. Cannons roared, bells rang out from every steeple. Crowds lined the street as King Henry, dressed in pale yellow satin, adorned with silver and pearls, led out his young bride. It was a gorgeous sight. Bishops and archbishops led the way in robes of gold, cardinals in scarlet, knights blazing with orders, officers of state— all added to the splendor of the sight. The next three days were spent in festivities. All seemed peace and good will. The young king, Charles X, was making friends with the Admiral Coligny. He already loved his new brother-in-law, Henry of Navarre. Catherine grew alarmed lest her plot should, after all, fail, and her own power over the young king should wane. She gave orders for the Admiral Coligny to be killed. Her commands were imperfectly carried out. The Admiral was badly wounded, but not killed. When Charles heard the news, he was in an agony of surprise and fear. His mother was in a panic. Huguenots gathered in angry crowds and discussed the need. Henry of Navarre vowed vengeance on the would-be murderer. It was after dinner, on the 23rd of August, that Catherine led her son outside into the private gardens of the Tuileries to unfold her plan. The time, she said, was ripe. Eight thousand Huguenots were in Paris, breathing revenge. In one hour the whole hated body of them might be put to death. To this the young king's sanction must be obtained, and first of all, Coligny must be killed. Charles burst into one of his fits of passion. "'Woe to any one who touches a hair of his head!' he cried. "'He is the only friend I have, save my brother of Navarre.' But Catherine would not give in. 
she knew she must conquer at last, and she did. Lashed into a frenzy, the young king started to his feet. "'Kill the admiral, then, if you like,' he screamed. "'But kill all the Huguenots with him. All, 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 so that not one be left to reproach me with his deed.' The word was spoken. There was no time to lose. Hastily through the darkness of the starless summer night, preparations went forward. Let every true Catholic tie a white band on his arm, put a white cross on his cap, and begin the vengeance of God, went forth the order. The signal was to be given by the great bell of the Palace of Justice at two o'clock in the morning. Soon after midnight Catherine went to her son. He was pacing his room in an agony of passion, swearing the Huguenots should not die. "'It is too late to retreat, even if it were possible,' declared Catherine. Feverishly, mother and son awaited the signal. As the harsh sound of the bell rang through the silent summer night, the uproar began. The sound of clanging bells, crashing doors, musket shots, was followed by the shrieks of the victims and the yells of the crowd, till the stoutest hearts quailed and the strongest trembled. Shaking in every limb, the poor young king shouted for the massacre to be stopped. It was too late. Already beacon fires had sent the signal through the land of France. Old men, young girls, helpless children were alike smitten down. Through the long dark night the slaughter continued, until Paris was such a scene of terror as human eyes have rarely seen. In vain did Charles order the massacre to be stopped at the end of one day. It was continued for a whole week, till some eighty thousand Huguenots had been slain. And the heart of Protestant Europe stood still with horror. End of chapter 11